You're at the cutting edge of cardiovascular sciences. I'm your host, John Cook. I'm professor and chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Sciences here at Houston Methodist. And with me today in the studio is my junior faculty member, Dr. Lee Lai, who's also an assistant professor in the Department of Cardiovascular Sciences. And we have an amazing guest tonight, uh, someone who is an internationally recognized authority in vasculitis and rheumatological disorders. And I'm going to let Dr. Lee Lai introduce our guest. Okay, uh, it's, my great it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Wayne. Um, Dr. Corne uh, Cornelia Wayne is an internationally recognized physician scientist in rheumatology and uh, vasculitis. Dr. Wayne received her medical and research training in Hanover, Hennyburg, and at German Cancer Research Center, and subsequently her fa uh, uh, held faculty position at Mayo Clinic and Emory University prior to becoming chief of immunology and rheumatology at Stanford University. In 2021, she was recruited to the Mayo Clinic, where she is professor of medicine and immunology in the division of rheumatology at Mayo Clinics. So Dr. Wayne studies immune aging and develops therapeutic strategies for rheumatoid arthritis and vasculitis. By um, examining immune cells from affected patients, her group has defined mechanism of tissue invasion and retention of inflammatory cells in the affected tissue. Um, so uh, uh, she also pub she, she also studied the mechanism of tissue. Um, uh, the metabolic alteration that fuels um, pathological behaviors in the immune diseases. So her uh, recent work that published in Cell Metabolism, which is very interesting to me, uh, identified the um, mechanism that the excessive uh, acetyl-CoA generated due to the succinate-CoA uh, ligase deficiency uh, lead to hyperinflammatory phenotype in the T effect cells and uh, rheumatoid uh, rheumatoid uh, synovitis. So this work is very interesting to me as we are also uh, study the acetyl-CoA uh, role in the cell phase transition. So hopefully we can talk a little bit of your work in this talk or maybe later, but Dr. Wayne, it's a great pleasure to have you at the cutting edge tonight. Thanks Connie for joining us. We're really happy to have you here tonight. Uh, Dr. Wayne and I were faculty colleagues at Stanford for a while and uh, now we've gone uh, separate ways, and you ended up at the Mayo Clinic. Um, you were there as a junior faculty member, were you not? Connie, tell us about that. Well, it was uh, kind of my entrance into being a physician investigator. And um, we then took uh, the research program via Emory University in Atlanta to Stanford. And um, I think uh, we are well equipped now as a crew to do molecular medicine, where our greatest need lies in having access to patients that are clinically well phenotyped and uh, where we can do translation from the bench to the bedside. I've always been so impressed by your work because you are a practicing clinician. You, you're you taking care of, of patients with rheumatoid arthritis, with vasculitis, with giant cell arteritis, with tachyasis. You're taking care of these individuals and you are understanding the molecular mechanisms underlying the vascular inflammation. Um, so there's not too many people like you, Connie, that can do that, can, can uh, operate so effectively at, uh, you know, two very, uh, they're extremes of, of uh, the lexicon of medical knowledge, you know, very basic science and, you know, um, really cutting edge clinical care. So uh, that's quite amazing. Um, uh, tell us a little bit um, more now about uh, your practice at, at Mayo. You're, you've uh, uh, returned to Mayo Clinic uh, where you are a junior faculty member now. Uh, tell us about uh, what you're doing there and your center. Well, uh, we have created a new program. And the program is uh, focused on immunity and inflammation, looking at how the immune system can actually deviate from being protective to being tissue damaging. Uh, we want to go from the bench to the bedside, but also from the bed to the bench. 
And uh, I think in that sense, my clinical practice has always inspired what is happening in Balea. At the same time, we want to take the progress that has been made in immunology and in understanding why inflammation goes overboard and injures the host, we want to take that back to the patient. And I think the time is ripe to do that, that we apply all these insights we have made into how the immune system functions under protective conditions and after, uh, under disease conditions, uh, how can we interfere with the immune system? Mm -hmm. uh, this interference will be requiring new ways of doing it, particularly now after the pandemic, because what we have seen happening during the pandemic, a huge experiment of nature, we saw that nothing is as important as having a functional immune system. Number two, getting older is a dangerous thing because that immune system isn't quite as functional. And number three, if we treat inflammatory disease by immunosuppression, we got to be careful. We cannot make the cure worse than the disease. We need to learn how to manipulate the immune system without taking away protection from the host. Mm -hmm. So that's the goals that the program has. Fantastic. Let, we're going to get into the details of your research program now, but before we do, uh, Connie, I'd just like to let everybody know that uh, they can get their questions to you in two ways. Uh, they can text DeBakey to 37607. So the number is 37607, and then you text DeBakey, and then text in your message. Or online, you can go to polev.com. That's P-O-L-L-E-V.com. Enter DeBakey, that's D-E-B-A-K-E-Y, and uh, respond to that activity. So why don't we uh, get your slides up, uh, Connie, and um, go through your talk. And uh, we may have some questions as you go along. So very, very good. So the idea today is whether we can actually look at how the immune system functions well and not so well in the model system of inflammatory blood vessel disease. Now, you know that blood vessels are really not frequently the target of autoimmunity, but if they are, it's a bad clinical scenario because blood vessels are immunoprivileged sites. Um, nature has made the decision that it wants to protect blood vessels and um, vasculitis means that this protective shield of the blood vessel falls. So I thought I would serve the audience the best by talking about cells, molecules, and pathways that go wrong ending up uh, to bring to the host large vessel vasculitides in which we know the immunopathology the best. So what has changed over the last decade is that we have understood that the last vessel vasculitides and here particularly giant cell arteritis and Takayasu's arteritis, the two most frequent large vessel vasculitides, that these are diseases with two major components. They have autoimmune features and the adaptive immune system goes away and it manifests with inflammation in the vessel wall. So this is truly a vessel wall centered autoimmunity. We now call this the vascular component of GCA or Takayasu's disease. But the diseases also have an autoinflammatory component, which depends on the innate immune system, manifests with a systemic acute phase response, and that is now described as the extravascular component of these vasculitides. So what is vascular GCA? Vascular GCA is a disease that manifests in uh, the temporal 
artery and we can go and take a biopsy to actually make the diagnosis in the ophthalmic artery leading to blindness, in the vertebral artery leading to strokes, in the distal subclavian leading to aortic arch syndrome, and of course, in the aorta itself. What is extravascular GCA? That's a syndrome that manifests with uh, muscle pain and stiffness that is often described as polymyalgia or medica, fever of unknown origin, a failure to thrive. And what really is behind this is an acute phase response. And what is an acute phase response? You all know this, that a, a trigger trauma infection malignancy activates mononuclear phagocytes and a, a soup of cytokines is being produced, um, like IL-1, IL-6, TNF, et cetera, triggering the uh, liver to actually produce these acute phase uh, proteins. And the good news about that is that we can easily measure them. They are robust markers. We can measure C-reactive protein. We can measure serum amyloid A. We can measure fibrinogen, et cetera. And so, we have an, a relatively easy access to diagnosing the extravascular component. But what about the vascular component of this disease? Well, giant cell arthritis is a cranulomatous inflammation in an immunoprivileged niche. And when we say cranulomatous, what we mean is that there is an infiltrate of T lymphocytes that are, uh, is mixed in with very activated macrophages that the pathologist often describes as histiocytes. And then of course, the patient can have these namesake um, giant cells, these multinucleated uh, macrophages uh, that uh, are part of this inflammatory infiltrate. To understand the pathology, is not easy because it's not easy to get to the large arteries. Uh, there is that problem that you can just go in and out of the aorta and check this. And uh, animals don't really have uh, such a thing as an aorta. So about a decade ago, we began uh, to create the immune avatar. This is human disease and human tissue. We created a mouse in which we actually engraft human arteries, and then we immunoreconstitute that mouse with the human immune system. We give it human myeloid cells, dendritic cells, T cells, B cells, designer cells that we make. And then we create actually vasculitis in that avatar. We can now treat this vasculitis or we can explore it uh, uh, by uh, subsequent biopsies. We harvest the tissue. We do bulk and single cell analysis. We can do spatial mapping, tissue transcriptome, flow cytometry, functional testing, et cetera. So this model system has been very instrumental to us in trying to understand what goes wrong in the immune system of these patients. So this is the emerging paradigm. We know that the host is, has genetic risk and environmental exposures, like in most autoimmune diseases. We know that there is a loss of self-tolerance. The host becomes autoimmune. We have named that transition point checkpoint number one. So a, a genetic at risk individuals goes into an autoimmune situation, but that doesn't mean that that individual has vasculitis. For that to happen, there needs to be loss of tissue tolerance. So the autoimmune immune system needs to find entrance into the blood vessel, and we have named that checkpoint number two. Now, once the immune system is at that tissue niche and builds arthritis, it still needs to make the transition into a chronic uh, an autonomous lesion, and we have named that checkpoint number three. And I'll briefly touch on these checkpoints and share with you what we have learned about these transition points where the immune system goes from being a good thing to being a bad thing. So in checkpoint number one, we know that there is failure of T regulatory cells. And that's not too surprising that autoimmunity could result when T regulatory cells fail. 
In this case, and these patients actually, these are CD8 T regulatory cells. I think the interesting part of it is that the molecular mechanism of this failure is understood. And so there are now opportunities to actually try to repair this defect. So CD8 regulatory cells inhibit by releasing exosomes that contain an enzyme that the cardiologists love, NADPH oxidase 2. The exosomes actually settle and integrate into nearby CD4 cells and inhibit membrane proximal signaling. And uh, this um, CD8 Reg cell in numbers as well as in activity go clearly down in our patients. You see here, we can freshly isolate these T-Rex out of the blood. We see that GCA patients have about half of the frequency. We can also induce these. We can uh, culture them and actually study them. Are these T-Rex uh, cells important in terms of disease? Well, if we take them into the avatar, we can, of course, test how well they can or cannot uh, affect the uh, uh, vasculitic activity. So what you see in the top row is that if no T-Rex are transferred into the avatar, then we have pretty intense inflammation in the vessel wall. You are looking at the infiltrate in the vessel wall. You see, if there are healthy T-Rex mixed in with the um, uh, transfer, then we can almost completely avoid any infiltration of the vessel wall. But if the T-Rex come from the patients, you see that there is aggressive infiltrates into the vessel wall of CD3 T cells. We know why they fail and why they do this. This has to do with aberrant signaling and the notch four through the notch four receptor. You see that the T-Rex cells of the patients have a um, notch four intracellular domain uh, that must be signaling because we also see that the notch target gene has five is upregulated. And here in the bar graph, you see the surface expression of notch four. You see uh, that a notch four is about doubled in uh, the amount and you see that has is induced as a sign of continuous notch four signaling. So if we specifically now interfere with the notch four signaling pathway, we can go back and test in the immune avatar whether these T-Rex are actually affected in their functionality by notch four. You see here that a normal healthy T-Rex will not allow the infiltration of the vessel wall. But if we force into that T-Rex the intracellular domain of notch four, then the disease goes unopposed. Vice versa, if we take the patient's T-Rex cell, we have very active vasculitis. If we now knock down notch four, then we can really nicely counteract uh, this defect and prevent vasculitis. How does this work? Well, the underlying mechanism is interesting. It has to do with the intracellular trafficking of vesicles. Under normal circumstances, the healthy T-Rex works by taking notch two from the surface, putting it into the early uh, endosome, uh, recycling some to the surface, but most of it is packaged in the late endosome and produces um, exosomes that contain NOx2, and these NOx2 containing exosomes are the suppressive element. No NOx4 signaling, uh, so this pathway is maintained and secured. In the patient's T Rex cell, what happens is that the early endosome expands and the recycling endosome expands. And the NOx2 from the surface is now not packaged into the late endosome, and the exosomes become NOx2 low. This has to do with NOx4 controlling the amount of RAP5, RAP11, and HAS5, which indirectly controls the amount of RAP7. The RAPs are uh, the enzymes that dictate 
the uh, intracellular vesicle trafficking. And so the defect of uh, the patient in building uh, working T-Rex cells has to do with rerouting of uh, intracellular vesicles. We do know that the CDA T-Rex loss of function in GCA patient occurs in secondary lymphoid tissues. So this is actually something that occurs outside of the vessel wall. It causes an escape of peripheral CD4 tails from their containment. It enhances the recruitment of pathogenic T cells into the vessel wall. And the underlying defect is a notch 4 induced rerouting of intracellular vesicles that disrupt exosome production. So, Connie, we so got uh, a couple of questions. Um, yes, go one, ahead. Uh, one, I guess, from, from myself. So, so it looks like uh, the, uh, in, in giant cell arteritis, the, the major problem, what's causing the vasculitis, is a failure of the uh, CD8 T regs. These are the regulatory uh, T lymphocytes that suppress inflammation. Is that correct? Yes. We have a, a loss, a defect in the T regulatory cells. And so the immune system is hyper because the T rex are gone. Right. And th that's very interesting. So it's the um, uh, overly active immune system is due to a failure of part of the immune system, the, the regulatory uh, T cells. Now, um, my understanding is that that same um, abnormality can occur in other autoimmune diseases as well. Is that is that true? That's correct. Yes, and you know there is great interest right now whether in autoimmunity we can restore T-Rex function, and one of the attempts to do that is to infuse into the patient growth factors for T-Rex cells, specifically low dose IL two which nurtures the T-Rex cells, and the attempt is, can we restore T-Rex function? Great. So a potential new therapeutic for autoimmune disorders would be these uh, T-Regs, or enhancing T-Regs. So here's some questions from the audience. Um, any hint why the T-Reg failure manifests itself specifically in the great arteries? Well, we just heard from you that that's not the case. In fact, T-Reg failure can occur in other diseases, but I guess still the question remains, why in the patient with giant cell arteritis does a T-reg failure cause a problem there? Yes. So if you allow me, I would like to go to the next two slides and um, look at what really goes wrong in the T-regs. So they have a problem with notch signaling. Their notch signaling is far too intense. So if we actually ask the question, what happens with the T cells that now make it from the periphery into the vessel wall? Now, their molecular whole, hallmark is the aberrant expression of notch one. So there is something very fundamentally wrong with notch signaling in this disease. On one hand, too much notch signaling destroys the T-Rex cell and too much notch signaling on the side of the affected T-cell makes them apparently active. And as you see here, the patients have in the periphery a population of cells that are spontaneously notch positive. So notch is a proto-oncogene and you all know that notch has a gain of function about 60% of patients that have ALL. So there is a connection between notch signaling and how lymphocytes function. This notch signaling defect is something very GZA patient. So if we go into patients with other autoimmune diseases, we will not see this. We do not know why patients that end up having this disease have this notch problem. But they have excessive notch signaling both in the effector side as well on the T-regulatory side. So that might explain why 
you've got that you get giant cell arteritis. That explains disease specificity. Yes. Um, there's another question from the audience, um, and it, it, I guess it relates to uh, in, in your immune avatar uh, when you induce uh, the the giant cell arteritis, the vascular giant cell arteritis. Um, how uh, does, is that the immediate cause of the extravascular manifestations, or are those somehow uh, independent? Are they, they, which comes first, cause and effect? Uh, what, what's the association between the, the vascular giant cell arteritis and the extravascular manifestations? Can I hire that person who asked that question? Because that's, of course, that's <laughs> the key It wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> that's the key question, right? Mm. Um, I would say from all we know, and if you listen carefully as we move forward, from all we know, the two components of disease seem to run on different trajectories. We do not know why that patient brings in these two components. There is this innate component that gives extravascular disease there is this vascular component that's adaptive. Uh, they must be. There must be a common root for the two. Yeah. I mean, it can't be just by chance. Another question uh, just came in. Your, 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 your talk is stimulating a lot of questions and it actually might be related to what you just said. Does notch signaling affect the endothelial cells as well? Oh, yes. Yes. I'll show you work. Okay. Next slide. <laughs> so. All right. If you have a notch receptor expressing T cell, may it find its ligand? And the answer to that is it does. And here are the endothelial cells. And what you are seeing is the endothelial cells of the vas abasura. CD31 is stained. This is a TCA negative artery. We are looking at the vas abasura very nice microvascular network that supplies the vessel wall. You go into a TCA positive ar uh, artery and you go into a TCA aorta. Now, what you see, and we found this by transcriptome analysis, that jacket one, which is the ligand for notch, is not present in a healthy artery. But you see that the endothelial cell is chapped full of a jacket one, both in the artery as well as in the aorta. Actually, in the aorta, we see very nicely that it is the luminal site of the endothelial cell that expresses jacket, the ligand, and such invites the receptor positive T cell to talk to it. And that uh, talk to each other, as you know, ends up not well for the patient <laughs> because now the endothelial cell is literally stimulating a T cell and is asking it to come in. We do know how the ligand gets upregulated on the endothelial cell. So if you go into the plasma of patients, you see that there is a strong elevation of VHEF. We know that VHEF drives up the ligand on microvascular endothelial cells. And we know that we can disrupt that upregulation by either anti-VHEF or by exitinib. So we can go into the other to actually test this effect. And you see here, we're in a tissue lesion, we have build an infiltrate of CD3 cell, we can stain in these CD3 cells now how often they make interferon gamma. You see that in spontaneous vasculitis, about 40% of the T cells make interferon gamma. If you feed that mouse VEGF, I mean, if you inject it, if you treat it, then you double that frequency. If you inject the mouse, with an antibody that, or a small molecule inhibitor here that inhibits signaling of VHEF, you see that you can reduce the uh, vasculitic activity. So yes, the endothelial cell is critically involved. I think the endothelial cell is really calling the shots about targeting of the disease. Mm 
And by expressing this notch ligand, the endothelial cell tells the T cell where to go. So really, when we are looking at checkpoint one, this loss of self-tolerance, we know that there is a poor T-Rex response of notch four positive CD8 T-Rex, and that there is inappropriate T-cell activation of notch one positive CD4 cells. This sets the stage for this loss of self-tolerance. Checkpoint two comes in by leaky jacket one positive endothelial cells, and now tissue tolerance is lost. Now, there's no longer protection of the vessel wall. Now the vas vasorum are actively inviting the immune system to come in. So the inflammation makes it into the artery. What does it do there? What is the nature of that inflammation? How does this inflammation, this granulomatous inflammation then lead to disease? Well, this is a temporal artery and you see what the inflammation does. You see, first of all, that we have this dense mononuclear cell infiltrate. You know, it took the world 20 years to understand that they are actually coming in from the adventitia. When we first described this, we had the hardest time to actually get resonance, but now this is the accepted paradigm. You see how the cells come in through the adventitia and then are actually sitting here at the adventitia media border. The vessel wall responds to this attack by building lumen occlusive intimal hyperplasia. The lumen is occluded. It, you know, it doesn't take any fantasy to understand that these patients go blind. There is complete blockage of blood flow. In the aorta though, of course, it is hard to plug an aorta. What happens is that the inflammation destroys the wall. You see here, the surgeons were in, they have replaced the ascending aorta. They have clipped the graft to the native aorta. You see that the native descending aorta still has problems and needs repair. What happens to the inflammation in this artery? Well, to address that question, we did a dual biopsy study. What we did is we did a temporal artery biopsy. We collected tissue and blood. We started these patients on high dose corticosteroids. We treated them. And then we took a second biopsy on the alternate side, the alternate temporal artery after three, six, nine, and 12 months. We wanted to know do the steroids wipe out the vascular inflammation? And how fast does this work? And what do you think? Um, before I show you the data, when is the disease gone? Well, here is the result. There were 10 patients in each arm. You see that after three and six months, almost all of the patients still have very active vasculitis. There's only few which you can switch to negative. That was not the surprise. The surprise was that after nine and 12 months, still half of the patient have active persistent vasculitis. And this goes directly to the question, how does the vascular and the extravascular arm of this vasculitis relate to each other? Because we can easily measure what the inflammatory activity is in the blood. We can measure a sedimentation rate or a CRP. And you know that most physicians utilize these markers as biomarkers of the disease. You also see that they are not very good biomarkers because the sedimentation rate, of course, was down after three months with the high dose steroids. As we took the steroids down, the sedimentation rate returned but the sedimentation rate did not tell us which patient was a responder and which patient was a non-responder on tissue biopsy. So the t the, what we measure in the blood is really not telling us what is happening in the blood vessel. In the blood vessel, 
the vascular component of the disease is persistent. 12 months into therapy, who would have thought we see persistent active aggressive vasculitis in half of our patients? We have persistence and we have autonomy. It's very difficult to treat. And opposite to what happens in the periphery, that's easy to treat. It is really independent from the extravascular inflammation. It's difficult to quantify. The acute phase response is of limited value. And we really haven't developed perfect tools to say what the disease burden is in the blood vessel. So if we go into the blood vessel now and we look at the immunology of this inflammation, what we see is an infiltrate that consists mostly of CD4 cells and a few CD8 cells. They sit in the adventitia and the media and they are functionally heterogeneous. They make interferon gamma, they make IL-17, they make IL-9, they make IL-21, they make IL-2, etc. That finding by itself tells you that there is not a single antigen that drives this inflammatory response. So it really led us to understand what are antigen nonspecific signals that these cells receive. And you know that a T cell needs not only to recognize antigen, but it needs co-stimulation through CD28, CD80, CD86, and it receives co-inhibition, as you guys and you know better than anybody in the world. Under normal circumstances, CD28, CD86 provides co uh, signals, and of course, when the T cell engages PD1 and uh, PDL1, then stop signals hold the T cell back. So in the end, the T cell makes the decision about going or stopping, not just by recognizing antigen. And we know that if we treat patients with a checkpoint inhibitor, which our colleagues in oncology, of course, do every day, then we disrupt the stop signals and we enhance the go signals and we produce immune-related adverse events. But the question is whether nature does this too and produces autoimmune disease. So I, I think you're going to get the, into the uh, treatment now yes. and, and make some comments about treatment. And uh, but uh, your your slide a, a few few slides ago, we got a burst of questions here. Uh, okay, because uh, I'm it was going back. Quite quite an interesting. Uh, uh, finding that you had this discordance, yes, uh, the discordance between the um, uh, sus evidence of, of, of systemic inflammation, like the C-reactive peptide, yes. And, yes, and the biopsy results. So you, yes. I think your point was that there's, these are two different processes, extravascular and vascular, yes. and uh, that, that stimulated some questions. One was, could steroids actually uh, impair the Tregs and, and cause more problems, um, and t the steroids seem to be pretty good at, at uh, treating maybe extravascular manifestations, but maybe not so much the vascular manifestations. These patients were on steroids. Yes, and these patients were on steroids, not at point zero when we did the first biopsy, but when they had their second biopsy, of course, they were on steroids, right? right. So um, do the, uh, well, at least you have to say the steroids take away the vasculitis in half of the patients. That's not bad, because I can tell you that all other medications we use to treat this disease, we have no evidence yet that they actually do anything in the tissue. That, that evidence is lacking, right? So steroids are, are not perfect by no means, but we know exactly what they do. They turn half of our patients into no vasculitis. We need much lower doses of steroids to actually treat what's happening in terms of the acute phase response. You know that the acute phase response responds to lower doses of steroids. It does so very swiftly and very acutely. We treat polymyotromatica with low doses of steroids very successfully. Right. Um, could the uh, the steroids actually impair T-reg function? 
we have looked into that. We don't think that the bad T-Rex are getting worse as we treat them. So remember the bad T-Rex have to do with excessive notch signaling. We do not know yet will the T-Rex cells find their notch ligand, but we think they find them in the uh, lymph nodes and in the bone marrow. So um, steroids might actually bring down notch ligand uh, expression in the lymphoid tissues. So we have no good evidence what happens in uh, uh, that the, the steroids exacerbate the problem. But I can tell you this here, we have been in these arteries and we have looked in patients that have been treated for a year. And when we look at patients that have been treated for a year, what we see is that the IL-17 production is wiped away. No IL-17, not a trifle left. But the interferon gamma production is essentially untouched. Mm -hmm. So steroids cannot disrupt the interferon gamma. They can disrupt the IL-17 production. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And then um, I, you, I think you're gonna get into this, but uh, one, one uh, questioner, is, one of the uh, attendees was wondering, is there anything else that can be done to stimulate the Tregs so that they are, have greater protective effects? Yes. I mean, you know, look, we make CAR T cells to kill tumors. Can't we make CAR T Regs? Let's find I mean, out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, or can, are there other vulnerabilities in the immune system of these patients where we could get to? So I'll show you in terms of how dependent is this disease on checkpoint signaling. So if you take a normal aorta, a normal aorta has nice expression of PDL1 and it has no PD-1 in there. That makes a lot of sense. You know, PD-1 is expressed on T cells, so a normal aorta has, has no T cells there. You see that a normal medium-sized artery, like a temporal artery, also has nice PD-L1. If you go into a GCA artery, there's very little PD-L1 expressed. So the patient is essentially the flip side to a tumor patient. The tumor patient expresses too much PDL1. The patient expresses too little PDL1. And if you look where this happens, then it happens on uh, dendritic cells in the tissue lesions, which in the GCA negative case have nice PDL1, but the patient cannot bring up PDL1 on the dendritic cells in the artery. What the patient does instead is that they let PD-1 positive T cells get into the artery and essentially every T cell in the infiltrate has PD-1 on the surface. So we see the flip side to the tumor. The tumor has high PD-L1 and inhibits the T cell. GCA has no PD-L1 and the T cell can just go. It is undisturbed. So we can set that scenario in the avatar. And um, let's just concentrate on the bar graphs where you see that if we make disease with the patient cells and we treat with anti-PD-1, we give them a checkpoint inhibitor, we make the disease much worse. You also see that if we try to induce disease with the healthy cells, we can't. But if we give them a checkpoint inhibitor, we can. Not frequently, but frequently enough that you and me see in our clinics patients now that develop vasculitis because they receive checkpoint inhibitors.
So the checkpoint is defective. And the big question is, could we restore the checkpoint? So what you expect if the checkpoint is defective is that you see broad-based expression of cytokines, as we see here, IL-1, IL-6, TNF, IL-21, IL-27, IL-7, IL-15, all up if we actually block the checkpoint. We see induction of uh, transcription factors, TBET, ROR, gamma, BCL-6. We see induction of T-cell effector cytokines, interferon, IL-17, IL-21. So this is what our colleagues in uh, the pathology department helped us to do. So if we give the avatar a checkpoint inhibitor, the density of T cells in the infiltrate doubles. So broken checkpoint and we make it worse. What is most interesting part of this is that the checkpoint controls how many T cells are there that we expected but we did not expect that the checkpoint controls intimal hyperplasia. So here you see, we can measure, of course, the thickness of the intima, which under normal circumstances is low. If we break the checkpoint, then the intima becomes multicellular with multiple layers with high proliferative activity. This intima begins to expand. And not only does the intima expand with it growing microvascular networks that supply this hyperplastic intima. So here we are looking for small blood vessels in the inflamed wall. We stain them with von Willebrand factor and alpha smooth muscle cell actin. And you see the pathologists have enumerated these microvessels for us. The checkpoint, if you break that checkpoint, you release control over this microvascular angiogenesis and the intimal hyperplasia. So really the disease is associated with a loss of function in the checkpoint and creates unleashed T cells. Oncologists intend that. They want to unleash the T cells. Our patients already have an unleashed checkpoint. So interesting enough, if you do the epidemiology of this and you go into Scandinavia, where they have many, many of these patients, there is indeed no signal for cancer susceptibility in these patients. They live long because they don't get cancers. The price they pay for having a very weak checkpoint is that they get autoimmunity. So we were of course interested in saying, well, if the PD-1, PD-L1 checkpoint isn't working so well, what about co-stimulation, CD28, CD80, CD86? Is that happening? Um, and here is where we connect into the field of immunometabolism. So BMS was able to provide us with an antibody that blocks access to CD28 and is purely antagonistic. See, if you do this, um, then you see that actually CD28 signaling changes oxygen consumption measured here in the seahorse machine. So CD28 signaling dictates how much oxygen the T cells consume. Uh, if we block access to CD28, we bring down basal as well as stress-induced respiration. And what we see in the other task is that in the artery cells accumulate that highly expressed GLUT1, the glucose transporter, and that highly expressed GABDH. So this is fax analysis of such cells in the artery in the blood and in the spleen. And you see that the lesion favors to have cells that have very, very strong glucose utilization and oxygen consumption. So if we actually block this, 
if we treat the avatar with anti-CD28, we can, uh, of course, reduce the density of the T-cell infiltrate. If we utilize key 67 as a marker of T-cell turnover, you see how nicely we reduce T-cell turnover. And if we do by facts analysis, look for specialized T-cells that can live in the tissue, these so-called tissue resident memory T-cells, you see how dependent they are on metabolic activity, oxygen consumption, and glucose utilization. Because once we take the CD28 signal away, these cells are clearly reduced in frequency. So the lesion has in situ T cell proliferation. The lesion supplies its own adaptive immunity. And we have accumulation of tissue resident memory T cells, which give the lesion autonomy. And I think once that lesion is established, the lesion no longer needs supply from outside. And that makes it so very hard for us to treat it. So it no longer actually needs the acute phase response that is happening in the periphery. That autonomy and the turnover in the vessel wall are clearly dependent on the metabolic wiring of the cells and uh, co-stimulation. So is the formation of these micro uh, microvascular networks. You see here that anti-CD28 nicely brings down the density of the microvessels. And you see here how the thickness of the intima. So these uh, cells, uh, these uh, arteries built this uh, really uh, intensive, this uh, neo intima that how that is dependent on signaling through CD28, and as I showed you, through PD1 and PDL1. So, what's going on in the lesion is strictly dependent on co stimulation and co inhibition. So, if we look now at this disease, we have a checkpoint one in which the host becomes autoimmune, very dependent on not signaling with inappropriate T-cell activation and this elimination of a good T-REC responses. We have a loss of tissue tolerance where the endothelial cells actually lets in the inflammatory cells. And then we have a checkpoint in the lesions where the T-cells become unleashed. And this has to do with PD-1, PD-L1 signaling and CD-28, CD-86 signaling. One is down, one is up. So these patients are really prone to very strong immune responses in the wrong place. So um, we can talk about how can we take the pathogenesis back to the clinic. Extravascular GCA, we are doing good in diagnosing it. We can just simply measure ESR, CRP, and other acute phase responses. We can easily treat this steroids and then blocking IL-6, of course, just wipes this out. Can we have drug-induced remissions? Yes. Can we have drug-free remissions? No. We take these away and this does come back. And this is what we see these patients returning into our clinics with flares of uh, their polymyalgia. And we see them come back and the sedimentation rate and the CRP goes up. But this is actually their minor problem. Their problem lies in their blood vessels. How do we make a diagnosis of this? ideally with tissue biopsy, and of course, with very elegant imaging technologies. I mean, it's hard to biopsy an aorta unless the surgeon is in there to try and repair it. Therapy, we know that steroids bring it down in about half of our patients. We do not know whether any other steroid sparing agent actually 
affects this. That study is rolling. We are looking at this. We need a dual biopsy study. We need to know this is the amount of disease at point zero. If we treat these patients, can we actually get rid of it? Do we have drug-induced remission? Partially, yes. Do we have drug-free remissions? I believe that we never reach drug-free remission. I believe that our patients continue on to have vessel wall inflammation. It's just a matter of, is this smoldering? Is this slow? How much activity does it have? Since these patients are in their 70s, it's actually no easy decision to make because, you know, what, which outcome parameters do you look at? With life expectancy extending, you can say it's becoming more and more important because A, you don't really want to repair an aorta in a 94-year-old. Another important implication of this work is really to understand that giant cell arthritis has a spontaneous loss of function in the PD-1, PD-L1 pathway, and that immune checkpoint inhibitors and cancer patients do exactly that. They set a loss of function in that pathway. So we see these patients coming to us with aortitis and vasculitis and iatrogenic loss of function in this pathway. And I think in the future, we will actually see more patients that develop this iatrogenic loss of function than the natural one. So um, before I, I actually give credit to the ones that did this work, and here is the team in uh, both um, institutions and of course, the faculty of the Mayo Aortic Center and uh, of Mayo Cardiovascular Medicine and Mayo Pathology has been instrumental in, in supplying these uh, tissues to us. Um, I should invite more questions. Uh, how are we going to make optimal use of what we have learned to serve our patients better? Well, that was wonderful, Professor Wyan. Thank you for that uh, wonderful talk, beautiful talk. Uh, we um, had some nice questions as we went along. A few more questions came in uh, during your talk, and I'm going to let Dr. Li Lai ask you those questions that just came in. Yes, uh, here's a question from an audience saying, um, can you uh, talk about immune checkpoint inhibitors increasing T cell immunity during SARS-CoV-2 infection? Yes. Well, I think the, with COVID infection, we have a double-edged sword, right? On one hand, we want to optimize antiviral immunity. On the other hand, we, uh, if we have a patient that requires a checkpoint inhibitor, like a tumor patient, we have this, what do we do here? Do we make it better or do we make it worse? I think that overall the benefit lies in inhibiting the checkpoint because we can strengthen immunity, we can strengthen anti-tumor immunity, we can strengthen antiviral immunity, and as you can see here, we can strengthen autoimmunity. So I think if we are prepared to deal with the side effects by strengthening autoimmunity, going to the checkpoint is an elegant way to make the immune system stronger. Okay. So um, there's another question asking, are there any nitro oxide abnormalities that are involved in the vascular immune processes? Well, yes, there are. So I think I mentioned that actually the T-Rex cells function by releasing exosomes. Yes. Oxygen. And these exosomes function and become inhibitory by containing NOx2. We do not know yet how they actually work. 
but I think that they interfere with nitric oxygen, oxygen, oxygen um, production and turnover and how they are handled on the cell level. So, uh, by the way, that is a strongly age-dependent phenomenon, meaning um, the failure of the T-Rex cell occurs in older individuals, much more so than in younger. And I think that's why the patients have this. But this crossover of bringing NADPH oxidase and ROS generation into the T-Rex biology, I think that means something. And we immunologists have to go after it. Well, that would certainly be an interesting new interface to look at, that uh, endothelial uh, T-cell interface. Well, thank you so much, Professor Wyan, for really a wonderful talk. And uh, really, thank you for your great insights into arteritis. And uh, you've taken great care of many patients over the years with uh, various forms of vasculitis. And uh, we're proud of you. Keep up the great work, Dr. Wyan. Oh, thank you very much. This was fun. Thank you. Well, I thank, thank you. you all for joining us tonight at the cutting edge of cardiovascular sciences. Our guest was Professor Connie Wyand from the Mayo Clinic, um, a uh, wonderful uh, internationally recognized uh, uh, scientist and clinician in uh, rheumatology and uh, inf inflammatory disorders. Thank you, Professor Wyand. Thank you.